Good afternoon, my name is Greg Ottinger and I am the Director of Online and Blended Learning at the County Office of Education. And if you weren't quite familiar with uh, what the County Office does, and that's a very valid question. <laughs> we, we provide support, uh, various levels of support, to the 42 school districts and 100 plus charter schools in San Diego County. Uh, more specifically, I work in the Technology Division and we focus on everything from supporting school districts, everything from being the internet service provider. Uh, a lot of people may not know that, that uh, the county office actually supplies the internet pipe for 38 of the 42 school districts in San Diego County, uh, all the way through uh, professional development. And we recently, and we're very, I'm very pleased and gratified to have uh, members uh, of our first cohort. Uh, our team also is co-teaching and has co-constructed a master's in ed leadership with an emphasis in uh, technology innovation. And that first cohort kicks off here in a, in a couple weeks and that's a partnership with San Diego State University. So everything from the element of what's happening in the classroom through that really basic rudimentary uh, pedantic uh, sending the internet connection through, everything in between. Uh, hello, my name is Bob Webb. I'm an architect with Webb Clef Architecture Engineering. We uh, specialize in school design and, for the, and have been doing that for the last 15 years in K through 14 schools. Um, everything from modernizing a single classroom to building a new high school, junior high, or middle school. And that's about it. <laughs> Hi, my name is Courtney Mail. I work for Padre Dam Municipal Water District. I'm actually the Development Services Supervisor and Engineer over at Padre Dam. A uh, lot of what I do is just making sure that any new development coming into uh, Padre Dam, which actually covers Santee all the way up to Alpine and Willows Road in East County, uh, meets our standards, uh, the water agency standards, make sure the design uh, meets all the codes and requirements and regulations that we have to uh, adhere to for both uh, health department and sound engineering practice. Um, a lot of what, uh, some of the stuff that I thought was pretty interesting we learned was just, you know, all the parts that go into uh, a water system to make your tap turn on. Um, I think uh, a lot of people don't know that when you turn on that tap, all the, all the things behind that, and especially down in our East County, by the time you get the water, it's gone through six different pump stations, um, many different lifts, a lot of pressure changes along the way, and literally miles and miles of pipeline to reach you. So, because uh, we import all of our water, we don't get it here locally, it has to all come through pipes from quite a ways away, so. My name is Steve Vandenberg. I am a meteorologist. Um, I actually started my career at the National Weather Service. Uh, I spent 10 years there, and part of that time I was the fire weather program manager. So basically what that means is I managed the red flag warning program for San Diego County, Orange County, the Inland Empire. Uh, and so I'm sure most of you are familiar with the red flag warnings, but basically those get issued anytime the weather conditions and the vegetation uh, conditions are conducive for, for large and rapid wildfire growth. And then um, <clears throat> three years ago, just about, oh, actually three years ago as of last week, <laughs> Um, I left the weather service and joined the other meteorologist at SDG&E, so now we are a team of two, um, <laughs> to uh, tackle the problem of delivering power to folks in the backcountry in these high-risk areas uh, and how to do that safely uh, under the conditions that exist uh, in our county, particularly in the summer and the fall. Um, and we've been working on lots of interesting projects and pushing the uh, the uh, edge of uh, fire weather science and doing some interesting things in terms of predicting uh, fire growth and fire size based on the various aspects of the vegetation and weather and how those things come together to, to affect the fire environment. But then in addition to that, obviously you, I'm sure you've all noticed, in fact, perhaps some of you uh, currently have solar panels on your roof, so there's a lot of renewable energy that's um, showing up in San Diego County. Both, uh, both at the residential level and also in a big sort of centralized uh, power plant type of level. And so uh, another one of our jobs has become 
to how do we better predict what's going to happen with renewable energy on a day-to-day -day basis so that it can be managed better on the grid for reliability purposes. Um, but really, I guess to sum that all up, we're, I'm very much in an uh, uh, emergency support role, emergency operations type support role, uh, fire weather preparedness and uh, integration of renewable energy on the grid. Um, so, and uh, I see there's another question on here. Some people want, might uh, want to know some of the um, some of the most amazing things or discoveries. And I don't know that I have just one, but uh, one thing I did do when I was in college in Oklahoma is I did get a chance to chase tornadoes. And so I've seen big hail and big tornadoes and uh, all sorts of interesting severe weather, 60,000 foot storms. So. Um, so those are, there's a whole list. If you ever want to hear any stories, you can give me a call. And tell you. <laughs> <laughs> On Sunday, you generated questions for them, so we selected a few from your questions, and we're going to begin with them. From our lovely teachers. <laughs> this grant is about in, the integration of math, science, and technology, and how it relates to the real world. How do you use technology in what you do? How does the love of math translate into your job? How does science come into play in your daily operations? I, I started off in college with a slide rule, so that tells you how old I am. And by the time I got out of there, uh, I mean, by the time I was in uh, my senior year, you had to have a handheld calculator. And we were also working with Fortran computers. So in my, in my profession, um, that the, was heavy in math and the education side um, to, for beam, column design, structural types of calculations. As I, uh, once, once I entered the profession, technology started changing very rapidly uh, to where now we don't have uh, drafting tools anymore. All we have is a computer and it, uh, uh, I can't tell you the last time I, I calculated an angle. I don't, I don't remember when that was. So all of that is kind of not, not doesn't happen in, uh, so much in my profession anymore, but it does happen in, uh, in the day-to-day -day basis where uh, you tell me you have 30 students and what you're doing and I, I calculate the room size. I'm calculating quantities for um, cost estimates and things like that, but it's not the higher end math. Usually, it's the lower lower end types of math. And what else? Yeah, we use um, engineering. Obviously, you're going to use math, but I agree that it's a lot of it is broken down. I mean, it, it comes down to uh, finding the simple solution. So you develop these standards and you develop these uh, codes that break down the complicated system and the complicated math down to a simpler level and whatever you can't do at the simpler level you need to learn a program to do you need to learn uh, as an example a water system analysis for a subdivision if you want to know what that subdivision is going to do there's too many loops and too many characteristics to know that when I turn on this hydrant or this house faucet what it's going how it's going to impact the system but on an individual level I can look at that home and tell you what flow it should have because I know a very simple equation um, Beyond that, the software involved, the, the system analysis you want to do is going to be uh, actually what my wife does, which is full hydraulic modeling, where you, you have all that system in there and you're running using a computer to run the high level math that uh, some of us had to do beforehand, but then we don't do anymore, definitely. So a lot of it comes down to breaking it down, um, trying to take that complicated issue and break it into as simple as possible. Uh, and using the simple math to solve the problem, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with doing on other things. So, technology, uh, we use a lot of different kinds of technology in our day-to-day -day job uh, at the Weather Center and, and at SDGD. Um, I think some of the more obvious things that might come to mind in terms of forecasting, we have our own in-house uh, high-powered computer clusters, basically it's a, like a mini supercomputer that runs very high resolution forecast models. And what a forecast model is, is basically um, a model that takes all of the, equi the equations of physics and all the equations of motion and, and math that we have in, in meteorology and solves for all these different variables in time going out, say, six days, seven days, eight days, whatever it may be. That's stuff that we just can't possibly do in an eight-hour day in our heads. So obviously, we rely a lot on technology just to crunch all the data that's coming in. We, 
We also, uh, we can't have our eyes, you know, we joke around as a meteorologist or even just as a general public, you know, if you want to know what the weather is, you got to look outside the window, right? <laughs> but there's only two of us at, the, at the, the office, so how can we possibly do that? So we've installed 149 weather stations across the county that, that are, in a sense are our windows to the world so that we know every 10 minutes the weather that's occurring on our entire system across this entire county. And uh, <clears throat> so that's sort of the situational awareness piece of that. Um, we, um, we have uh, communication technology. So it's not just enough to have all this data, but how do you communicate it to the company, particularly to people who aren't meteorologists? We're the only two meteorologists in the company, but we have to communicate this to people who have all sorts of different backgrounds. So, you know, the technology in a sense does a lot of our, what our job, what a meteorologist's job used to be. And our job has become to manage all this technology and then figure out a way to communicate it to the decision makers within the company. So, uh, I can't just tell them live fuel moisture is 67%, but dead fuel moisture is in the 10 hour fuels or 15%, because that's not gonna mean anything to them. So it's, how do you take all this information and then communicate it in a way that the decision maker can understand? Um, and then of course, the other challenge we have is making sure this technology uh, operates efficiently and doesn't, you know, and, and is maintained. Because we rely so heavily on technology that it just takes one of those pieces of equipment to fail and then you've, your day is now consumed with not meteorology, but fixing a computer or fixing a weather station or something like that. Um, so, I don't know that anybody answered the math question. I didn't, oh good, because I was gonna say I didn't really love math, so. <laughs> In terms of the technology and the math, um, by show of hands, how many people expect to receive a, a paycheck from the County Office of Education uh, tonight or tomorrow? The County Office does payroll for 55,000 people, and yes, if you're in Santee or Lakeside, the, your, your paycheck comes through our, our office. On any given, uh, the way that we collaborate with our team across the technology division, uh, and we are in charge of payroll, HR, finance, all those different pieces. So every time the district cuts a check, a lot of times that goes through us. We sit around and think about the different technologies that go into play, whether it's on the educational technology side, making sure the devices work. But in terms of the math, it's very important that your paychecks are correct. Am I right? I'm sure you'd rather round up. Yeah. <laughs> But it's very interesting in terms of on a day-to-day on -day basis, and just focusing on the, uh, the payroll piece, because it does hit home, uh, 55,000 people get paychecks. That's all the school districts uh, besides San Diego Unified and the community colleges. Uh, with 55,000 paychecks, that's a lot of different organizations that have different stipulations. Every time uh, there's different ratifications to uh, collective bargaining agreements, uh, if there's a new piece of legislation that does something different, if STIRS changes a policy, if PERS changes a policy. All these pieces go into play in terms of the retirement calculations and all these different pieces. And if you start to add up, that's a tremendous amount of math. Uh, do you have a doctoral stipend? Did you work extra hours this month? All of that getting down to 55,000 different individuals that all have their own different calculations. How much are you putting into retirement? How much uh, are you electing into these different funds? It, it's, a, it's a tremendous amount of math to put together uh, to make sure uh, all, of that, all of that works. So in terms of, uh, we, we don't have the incredibly high level algorithms to you know, check seismic drifts or anything, uh, but in terms of understanding how finances and formulas come together, it, it's a critical element, uh, certainly in, in my office. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Um, my question is just a two-parter. Our question, our question we came up with, um, what are some challenges that you encounter in your career? And then with those challenges, how do you go about solving them? Or one particular one that you'd like to talk about? Um, we have a we have a fun problem right now in the water district you may have heard about a little bit of supply and demand problem going on um, so you know a lot of it is just looking to new technology and new ideas uh, trying to figure out ways to 
minimize cost while still providing the best benefit, get water that currently is 100% imported, can we find a local supply of water, um, doing additional research and you know, using, uh, using the weather patterns if we have them, using the, what we've been doing more recently is a lot of groundwater studies. So a lot of research into our groundwater supplies to can we injection water into the groundwater, uh, recycled water, and draw it back out as clean using nature's process to do it. Uh, getting the uh, removal of bacteria that you need to do to make this water safe. So it's a lot of, uh, a lot of utilize, utilization of new technologies and a lot of computer and modeling and um, the, obviously the math behind it. So I, th I think the most obvious challenge that I currently have uh, in my current capacity as a meteorologist at sdg &E is how do we predict when the conditions are ripe for large fires and when they're not. And that may sound like a simple question to answer, and it's really not. Um, and then what do we do about that? Um, so when I first arrived um, three years ago, uh, we had just started deploying all these weather stations out there that were delivering 10 minute data, wind speed, temperature, humidity, all across the back country. Um, and so, we started taking this data and analyzing the data just to, just to try and get a better understanding of the weather. And the first thing that happened when we did that is we realized that everything we'd ever been taught in school about Santa Ana conditions or Santa Ana winds was wrong. And that they're not actually funneling through passes and canyons, but it's more analogous to rapids in a river. So once we had that, we were able to start working toward figuring out how to produce a much better wind gust forecast or wind forecast for San Diego County. But that's just one piece of the fire problem. The other piece is the vegetation. And so we embarked on a big project with the Forest Service and UCLA and, and our own fire coordinators at SDG to try and figure out, well, how do, we, how do we determine what the fuels are doing and how does that actually affect the fire? So, so we began to study the dead vegetation. We studied the live vegetation. Um, we studied the grass. We started figuring out how you can measure some of this stuff from space. How do you measure it uh, on the ground? And, um, and then once we had that, uh, we were able to start correlating it to the fire, fires that were occurring at the time. Then what we did is with all those computing resources that we had, we created a climatology, a 30-year climatology of all this data going back 30 years and then correlated all this various information, all this data that we collected to historical fire currents. So long story short, by taking all this data, analyzing it, um, modeling it, applying various math and science and, and um, even social science to all this data, um, we were able to <clears throat> develop a model that basically tells us on any given day, for instance, today, there is a 10% chance that if a condition occurs uh, say Wildcat Canyon, like we had yesterday, that there is a 10% chance that today it'll grow to 1,000 acres, but a 1% chance that it'll grow to 5,000 acres. So uh, that's just one example of how we've used, uh, you know, math and science to solve a problem. Um, and that's very much the short version, but uh, I'll spare you all the details. <laughs>